This annual event is our biggest fundraiser of the year, and our objectives each year are pretty simple. We have two of them. The first one is we want to raise some money to help provide scholarships to students. And second, we want you, our attendees, and our donors to walk out of here with some insights and knowledge that you didn't have when you came in the door that will help you become a little bit more successful in both your personal and professional lives. Uh, as for that first objective, the raising money part of that, um, I'm, I'm happy to report that we can check that box. Thanks to all of you and your generous support, this year's event, this year's event is the most successful one we've ever had. In fact, you guys blew the doors off of our previous record and helped us raise over $77,000. So thank you. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our uh, executive sponsor, Deloitte Consulting, folks at this table right over here, as well as our platinum sponsors, ESPN, Pratt & Whitney, and Stanley Black & Decker. And in addition to them, I want to thank all of our uh, attendees and sponsors. The rest of the sponsors are listed both in your program book and on the signage of your table, so thank you all. Um, earlier, I had said that one of the purposes of this event this morning is to raise money for scholarships. And at one level, that's true. Um, but what your contributions really do is to allow students to gain the skills they need to make a better life for themselves and their family and to become productive members of the Connecticut economy. And as I've learned in the 25 years or so that I've been involved with the foundation, relatively small amounts of money can make a huge difference in the lives of these students. Um, these are folks who, although they have the drive and aspiration they need to, su to be successful, sometimes just find themselves a little bit short on the cash part of it. But nobody can explain the impact that your generosity can have than one of the folks who benefited from that kindness. So I'd like to introduce you to one of those students now. She's Adina Bakia Matthews. Uh, as you'll hear, uh, her determination and grit has allowed her to deal with a whole bunch of curveballs that have been thrown her away. But in spite of that, and in spite of her uh, resolve and fortitude, her pursuit of a college education wouldn't have been possible without a little financial help. But as I said earlier, she's going to be able to explain that a whole lot better than I can. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Adina Bikia Matthews. dream about what our lives should be like. We have short-term goals, long-term goals, and the goals that somehow just sneak up on us while we're busy living our lives. I've had many different goals since I was a teenager. I was going to be a millionaire by the age of 25. That didn't happen. I was going to have my own shelter for abandoned animals at some point, too. This may still happen. And lastly, I wanted to become someone that mattered, someone that somehow moved the mountains with bad odds and changed the future. This goal is actually the only one that I feel like I'm close to achieving. My life journey started in Bosnia, where I was born and grew up with my mother. I did not have a father figure present in my life, and as I grew up, I found that I found out that there indeed was a father. He died from cancer a few years after I was born, and the same father of mine had suggested to my mother that I should be given up for adoption shortly after I was born. So early on, I knew my mother was everything I had, and I had to fight and reach for the stars to change the outcome of my own life and make her proud over the decision to keep me, even though at the time it meant the struggle of being a single parent with no support. My childhood was quite traumatic. I happened to be born five years before the war started in Bosnia and lived through it with my mom. About five and a half years ago, I came to the United States by myself with big dreams and no funds to make those dreams and goals come even close to reality. I was fortunate enough to have Tunsis Community College as a choice for the first step in my educational path, and I have enjoyed it more than I ever thought I would. However, even though I have worked several jobs at the same time during the last two years while trying to focus on my studies, things were and still are tough. But I keep on fighting and giving up is never an option. Tomorrow is a new day with new possibilities for dreams to come true and goals to be achieved. The last two years at Tunxis and a lot of hard work has resulted in two Honor Society inductions this past year, 
and being on the Dean's List for five semesters in a row, which is how long I've been at Texas. In 2012, I applied and received a Texas Faculty Scholarship, the pride of getting my name called up and walking up to the stage to receive an award for my hard work was better than any feeling I've ever felt. Someone believed that I deserved to be recognized and wanted to help me reach my educational goals. I wanted to cry and scream from all the excitement and gratefulness I felt. This scholarship was such a tremendous help and made my financial struggles less intense, which meant the work for me. I decided to apply for the second year girl and got the Texas Faculty Scholarship once again. I remember having butterflies in my stomach and feeling so grateful and appreciated since, again, the amazing group of generous Texas Foundation board members really believed in me. What made this year's award ceremony back in May so special was the fact that my mom was here, visiting for the first time as a special guest at my wedding and an even more special guest at the scholarship award ceremony. Each one of you helped create an everlasting memory I will tell my future children about one day. My plan is to graduate next spring and start the nursing program next fall with dreams of eventually obtaining a master's degree in nursing. This was just the dream until the opportunity for all of it came about. Thanks to each one of the numerous sponsors, corporations, and the Texas Foundation Board, my dreams are now on their way to come true. I will never be able to thank you enough for your wonderful support. The only way I will be able to give back what you have given me is through having the best possible educational performance. One of my many long-term goals now is to one day be able to support students like myself that have big dreams, endless goals, and need someone to believe in them the way you believe in me. Thank you. first part of the agenda, kind of why we do this. Uh, the second objective, in terms of imparting those little pearls of wisdom uh, to you folks, is the job that falls to our feature speaker, Mark Bertolini, who is the chairman, CEO, president, and so I've heard the self-proclaimed chief tweeting officer of the healthcare giant. Um, and even though I'm not a betting man, um, knowing what I know about Mark, I'm willing to take bets that he is more than up to the task. Um, Back in the early part of this year, uh, when we were planning this event, um, we knew that it was going to be held in October, and we had a hunch that there might be a little bit of interest or a buzz around this issue of health care, given that at that point, the, uh, a lot of the implications of the Affordable Care Act would be just around the corner. Um, but I've got to tell you, our crystal ball wasn't as good as it turned out. It didn't, I didn't think it turned out as good as it is. Um, there is a fair amount of buzz around this, and so this topic is of great interest today as evidenced by the attendees here today. Um, anyway, um, given our suspicions, uh, given our suspicions, we went in search of a speaker who was actively involved in shaping the debate on healthcare in the U.S., and who could help shed some light on what is a very complex subject. And boy, did we hit a home run with the speaker we have for you this morning. And Mark, we have not only a major player in the national dialogue on healthcare reform, but we have a very generous human being who has a very compelling personal story. The abridged version of his amazing journey is that he was born and raised in the Detroit area as one of six kids of an Irish mother, Italian father, trained by Jesuits, worked on an assembly line at a Ford Motor Facility, got his undergraduate degree at Wayne State, his MBA at Cornell, got into the insurance business, and then quit to move in with his son at Boston Children's Hospital to help his son recover from what was then believed to be an incurable cancer. After holding key roles and a few other insurers, he joined Aetna in 2003. The following year, Mark survived a serious spinal cord injury himself while skiing, and three years later, once again, came to the aid of his son by donating a kidney. Mr. Bertolini assumed the role of CEO in 2010, and a few months later became chairman. Today he meets regularly with state and federal policymakers and is acknowledged as one of the most influential and knowledgeable voices in the national dialogue on how we increase access, lower costs, and improve the quality of health care. As a result of his life experiences, uh, Mark has become a big believer in the healing power of yoga 
meditation, and I've heard Budweiser beer. <laughs> I go on, but Mark's more detailed bio is in the program, and believe me, your time is much better spent this morning listening to this guy than it is to this guy. So without further ado, Mark Bertolini. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank everybody um, for being here today and for your generosity to this great program. Um, I am a member of the President Obama's Skills for America's Future. I'm one of the board members. And our stated goal is to connect community colleges to the needs of employers in the community. And I can tell you that as an employer who has a lot of Tunxis uh, graduates in our program, you've done an incredible job as a school, and your help here financially helps that put more people to work and helps organizations like ours grow and prosper in this community. So thank you very much for that. Um, at the end, that was great. That was perfect. Um, she was nervous about coming up here and speaking. You did a great job. Um, you know, you have a great dream. You should pursue it. Um, in 1979, I was putting together rear axles of the Mercury Bobcat on the Ford Motor Company assembly line after flunking out of college for my second time. And look what happened. Of course, I'm an insurance executive. So. Um, a couple of uh, qualifications up front. Um, I'm usually not tethered to a podium, so if I wander a little bit, um, I offer my apologies, and I usually have the slides um, down in front of me. And here are all of our Tungsis students at Aetna. And Elise and, and Paul are right here at the front table with us today. But we hire extensively from schools in the community. We have great training programs. We create underwriters, although we don't need as many of those these days. We create actuaries, who are the nearest things to God, according to what I hear from them. And we train um, group school members who, in our program, our group school members from across the nation um, are in the senior executive ranks of most of the insurance companies in America. So we have great training programs at that, and you help us with that, thank you very much. So I wanna talk a little bit about our values as a company. Um, this value wheel was created or updated when I became CEO in 2003, or 2010. We initially did it in 2002. And the whole idea was, how can we convey to our employees in the organization what their job is when there isn't someone around to tell them what to do? And it's all about putting the people who use our services at the center of everything we do. And we updated this in 2010 when I became CEO through a grand experiment. We opened up our internal Facebook called Java, and we had all of our employees opine from around the world, all 36,000 of them, what do we think about as our values as a company? And one of the new values on here is caring. Now, most for-profit corporations don't have caring as part of their value um, wheel. But our employees felt it was important because we were talking about this issue of empathy, understanding who we were caring for every day. And based on my own personal journey, I think I'm uniquely prepared to comment on that because I've spent more than enough time in the healthcare system and seeing how it doesn't work and how helpful we could be if we redirected our energies toward helping people get better. And it's the basis for our new strategies and organization. So the employees want to caring, the executives wanted compassion, because caring means we'd give everything away. We wouldn't have any money left in the pockets by the time we done. And so, of course, they brought it to the CEO. These kind of issues come to the CEO occasionally. And I went home for the weekend, and I Googled caring, and I found a speech from General Petraeus to the troops in Afghanistan on caring. I said, if General Petraeus can talk to people about caring that have guns, that have bullets in them, that they fire at other people, we can probably get away with it. And our employees, <laughs> have embraced us, and as I go around our business, and I visit every cubicle when I go on site visits to talk to each of our employees and thank them for the work they do, they share their stories of caring with me and how they made a difference in people's lives. So, so this is Downward Dog, um, Downward Facing Dog, for those of you um, who do yoga. Um, if you can do this, you are a yogi. Um, if you can't, keep practicing. But what this is all about is starting to define health differently across the industry. Why? Well, we are at a moment in time when we have an action-forcing event called the Affordable Care Act that causes us to change the way we think about how the healthcare system works. And given my personal experiences as an executive and as a father and as a patient, 
I can tell you the system needs to change, and I'll share with you some of the trends why. But what healthy should be defined as is that a productive, a healthy individual is a productive individual. A productive individual is an economically viable individual. An economically viable individual that is healthy is happier. And if we had happier people, we'd have happier communities, and we'd have a happier nation. Not the state we're in today. So we want to redefine health, and so we've put this program together, and I, although I'm always upset about using an adjective as a, as a noun, um, and this, or an adverb as a noun, um, what's your healthy is really our campaign. And we've had millions of people come to our site and tell us what they think healthy means. For young people under the age of 25, it's looking good in their underwear. <laughs> That's the common trend. For people over 50, it's being able to walk a mile. <laughs> so you can put yourself in that picture in the way you like. So I want to share with you six facts about why the healthcare system needs to change and the issues that are compelling us to change beyond just the action forcing event of the Affordable Care Act. First, this top line is the cost of premiums and the cost of health care. You can see they're very tightly aligned. And that relationship has existed forever. So when you look at what premiums rise, you're looking at what the underlying health care costs are rising. And that's a very tight relationship. The big problem is down below is wages and inflation. It's just eating up more and more and more of the personal disposable income of America. And when you look at what employers have done over the last six years, is they have shifted 50% of their increase in health care costs, 50% onto their employees, either through premium sharing or out-of-pocket costs. And for those of you that are small employers in here, you know you've been doing this. And the result is, is that now today in America, people pay for 41% of their health care out-of-pocket, either through premiums or out-of-pocket costs with benefit sharing. That will soon be over 50%. And when that goes over 50%, we have a different market. We have a retail marketplace. And I know a lot of employers are looking at, should I put in my employee in a private or public exchange? Should I give them the money to go buy their own health care and let them make their choices? This is a big issue. And if you look at where utilization is today in the marketplace, utilization is low because people's wealth has been hit by the recession. People are underemployed, generally. Wages have remained flat to down. And the result is, is that personal disposable income, which they now have to use part of to pay for their health care, makes tougher and tougher decisions. So it's the economy driving the utilization. It's not the Affordable Care Act. Nothing's happened in the Affordable Care Act to make that difference. It's really what's happening with the economy and people's income. The second is, is in spite of all of our spending, we are an outlier. You can't even fit us on a line. This is the relationship between annual spending per person and overall life expectancy. And our life expectancy is very quickly being approached by China. China's only two years behind. And yet they spend $40 per person per year for their health care. Now, the fact of the matter is, is in China, 50% of the savings rate they have 50, a 50% 50 savings rate of which a third of that goes to their health care because they have to pull out of pocket in order to get health care. But this is a very big problem. And then this is the bigger problem. And this is where the issue is and this is where the opportunity is as we look at health care reform. This is an IOM study, Institutes of Medicine. It's doctors. So this is not an insurance executive or an actuary or somebody in Washington. This is the I Institutes of Medicine who came up with a study that said 30% of what we spend on health care dollars is wasted. And you can see the waste. Unnecessary services, inefficient delivery, fraud. You've got administrative costs being 25% of it. Inflated prices and prevention failures. All of this is an opportunity. We solved this problem. If you updated it to today's numbers, it's $810 billion. But if you were to solve this problem, we could pay back half the nation's debt over the next 10 years. Half of the $16 trillion could be paid back in a decade. And we do a lot to solve our nation's fiscal problems. 
So people often wonder why the president was focused on health care when the economy was so bad. Well, quite frankly, the economy is health care. 75% of the next $10 trillion of debt will be driven by Medicare and Medicaid. So one of the founders of Fix the Debt in Washington, which is a much talked about group, um, and our whole mission is to try and get to the bottom of entitlement reform. And the opportunity is not in increasing the retirement age or means testing eligibility, it's really in solving this issue. We get this solved, we have an opportunity. We just solve 20% of it, we don't have to raise taxes to pay for the Affordable Care Act. And then here's what else is happening in the system. This is what has the hospitals and doctors frightened. You can see these two lines at the bottom. You, know, you have to suspend disbelief for a moment and assume that hospital costs are appropriate. Okay, So we have to say that the 100% line is a reasonable line. That's their cost line. But Medicare and Medicaid chronically underpay. And what commercial insurers do is they pick up the slack. It's called the cost shift. This is the largest single tax increase on the middle class and on business in America's history. We pay 140% of costs as a commercial industry on average to cover the underpayment of Medicare and Medicaid. What the hospitals and doctors have figured out is that if health reform continues and more people go into public exchanges and into Medicaid, they're going to continue to get underpaid. And the commercial market's going to go away. So the commercial markets are dropping off, Medicare and Medicaid's getting larger, and all of a sudden their whole cost model starts to fall apart. So that causes them to think differently about how the system's organized. And then finally, the economics of independent physician practice are collapsing. Three years ago, cardiologists had 55% of their practice revenue and more of their profit come from nuclear medicine in cardiology. Medicare changed the reimbursement for nuclear medicine, and over 80% of cardiology practices are now parts of institutions. This is overall physician practices in the United States. Since 2006, what we've seen is a dramatic rise from about 25% to over 70% of practices in the United States being owned by institutions. Now, the other interesting statistic, which I don't have on here, is that a lot of those institutions now have physicians running them. So it's a very different delivery model. And then finally, consumers have finally figured out that you can use these little things that you carry around in your pocket for your health care. In the past, they didn't. And we forced them into paper. But now what's happening is a revolution in the way people use digital services. And so people are thinking about, can I customize my own health plans? Can I do my own monitoring? I don't know how many people in there have the Fitbit or the up band or whatever it is that connects to your phone that talks to you about your fitness, all of those things are the rage now in the healthcare marketplace. I can track me, I can take care of me, it makes a difference about what I do. And now we're starting to see using video conferencing, Skype, other services to talk to my doctor. Email, as my children tell me, is dead. We just don't know it, most of us in this room. So is the use of a telephone. When I call them on their very expensive smartphones, I instantly get an IM back or a text that says, what do you want? <laughs> it's usually about, how about picking up your phone? And so I went on to Twitter. My daughter is the uh, executive editor of Gawker in New York. Um, and so she's their social media expert in helping them move into the social media world. And she's the one who educated me on sort of how to think about using social media. Our goal at Aetna is over the next three to four years is to get rid of email and move totally to social media as a way of interacting with our clients. And the reason I'm out on Twitter is for that very reason. I was one of the first, I was one of the first five CEOs to actually go out on Twitter myself other than having my PR team do my Twitter for me. It was frightening for the team around me because they were afraid <laughs> that I was going to do something terrible. But unfortunately, authenticity requires that you do it yourself and that you're out there and you're engaging with people. And for all of you who are wondering what Twitter is, Twitter is about listening. It's about finding out what's going on around the world. So this is really a huge phenomenon. So the Affordable Care Act's really about changing the economics of healthcare. And it's really about changing the role of the actors in healthcare. And it's forcing this unsystem to be a system. I moved into my son's hospital room back in 2001 and 2002 to care for him 
because the system was going to kill him if I didn't. And it wasn't because anybody was being malicious, it was just uncoordinated. Doctors turned over every three weeks in the staff. The residents were tired at 2 a.m. in the morning when they did renal dosing. The nutritional team didn't know how to treat his issues relative to the graft versus host disease he had. All those things, and I had to become an expert in coordinating his care because the system doesn't have a place for that, yet people need it. And one in three people will have a severe bout with cancer before their lives end. So that means all of us have an opportunity to learn how to make the system work better. And it's been my goal since I came back to work in 2003 to do just that. So here's my favorite slide. This is how the healthcare system works today. And that rat is a patient moving through the system, trying to find, they usually make me take the rat off, but I thought this is a different kind of audience. <laughs> but I always tell people I usually have a rat on there anyway. Uh, but this is how the healthcare system works. You have to find your way yourself. None of the information is connected. It's not about you, it's about the process. You are an arm. You are a heart. You are a cancer. You, not, you are not a whole person. And so this whole issue is really what we're trying to tackle. There should be no reason why these parts can't be connected. The technology is available. People want it. Actually, people are now starting to expect it. So what role can we play? And so we're driving change in healthcare in three ways. First, Aetna is getting out of the business of telling providers what to do, and we're giving them the technology to do what we do. So over the last three years, we've spent about $3 billion developing a technology stack that allows, insurance, allows hospitals to become insurance companies. We've now done 30 of these around the United States. We have another 35 in letter of intent and 200 in the pipeline. But what it is, is it's really about let's make the local health care system a system that can understand how to manage risk. And what we can be is the intellectual property provider to let them manage that risk more effectively. We can help them with the data, and we can be their access to the equity markets, we can be their bank. But we don't need to be the provider of care. And so we're building virtual systems where hospitals can connect doctors and hospitals can connect with other hospitals so that there is one version of the truth relative to Mark Bertolini when he's going through the system. We've now connected 29.8% of the hospitals and doctors in the United States together. We continue to do more with our technology from Medicity. But it's all about creating this platform where clinical information is immediately available so they don't have to redo tests. My favorite story is when my son and I were doing a kidney transplant. We went to the nephrologist and he ordered $2,500 worth of tests for each of us in the morning. That afternoon we went down to the kidney transplant physician who handed us the same tests to be done again. And when I said, well, why don't you just get it from down the hall, he said, our systems don't talk. And so I said to him, what is your email? He said, why? Because I have the results on my Blackberry. It was back in Blackberry days, for those of you who still have them. Um, and how many people in here saw Blackberries? Wow. Um, well, that's you it's coming. <laughs> um, and I sent them, and he said, what did you, and I, he said, how did you do that? I said, it's called secure messaging. It's email. And so the ability to move information around should be a lot easier. So we've corrected the tech, collect, we've made the technology stack. We're giving away our intellectual property and case management, actuarial and underwriting. We're becoming the intel inside behind the healthcare system, assuming the risk and managing the patients and being connected versus being the people in the middle. Now this model comes from a model developed by Clay Christensen that says when the black box gets opened up, the industry gets commoditized. And that's what the Affordable Care Act is about. And you have two choices. You get into the fetal position, in the corner, thumb and mouth, and hope it all goes away. Cut your costs, reduce your pricing, and hope you're the last person standing. Think about the steel industry. Or you take what's valuable to the rest of the system, repackage it, and make yourself valuable in other parts of the system. And in the healthcare delivery system, instead of owning it, what we've decided to do is to fuel it, to connect it, to be an important part of its future as part of our mission. The second part is public and private exchanges. We are the largest, which is safer to say in this audience than the most, 
We are the largest public exchange participant in the country. We're in 132 markets, and in 62% of those markets, we are the low-cost bronze and catastrophic plan in each of those marketplaces. Because we believe this is the marketplace of the future, public exchanges and private exchanges, which are emerging quicker than public exchanges, are going to be the place in the future where people will go to buy their health care, much like they buy their airline tickets, their hotels, for travel. The evolution will be a lot the same. Public and private exchanges will emerge. There'll be online marketplaces where people can shop for health care, much like they have shopped for travel. And so these new models are models that we're beginning to fuel and we're investing in. We just hired a new executive, Dewana Lewis, who heads up our private exchange consumer experience. She reports directly to me. And Dewana ran the healthcare vertical at Walmart, the $31 billion healthcare vertical, and also worked at WellPoint a few years earlier. So we're beginning to build this technology on the front end. And in the end analysis, what we'll do is we'll connect these new exchanges to the front end of these new provider partnerships. And we'll let the hospitals in the community and the doctors interact with their community and keeping the population of that community healthier. So the goal of every health system is an economic partner in the community should be to improve the health of the population based on its disease states, its demographics, its disease burdens, the cultural environment and social trends in that, in that community. And if we build our health system to support that based on the demographics and needs of that community, and they do that work of making people more healthier, have more productive, economically viable, and therefore happier, then we create much different communities than the ones we have today. And the health system becomes not a cost, but an important economic partner in making that community vibrant. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Now that will happen long after my tenure, because it will take time. But we're doing it today in China and in the Middle East. Where we're building these systems where governments who are looking at the US history of healthcare costs, China now has 114 million diabetics are very concerned about the cost and what it will do to their economies in the future and want to get in front of the mistakes we've made in the West. And then finally, we connect it with an integrated digital experience. Sooner or later, it's going to take over. And for those of you that are Luddites and refuse to interact that way, it's going to happen. And your children will do it, and your grandchildren will do it, and the system will be fundamentally different. And we're already doing it today. We have a new set of technologies that allow the system <coughs> to focus around the member. What if the system was about you? And what if that system allowed you to be healthier, productive, and happier? And then what if that system worked in a community where providers were connected, so you had happier and healthier communities, and a nation? Wouldn't it be nice to improve the civility of our dialogue in this country today by virtue of doing it? And then finally, we think we can do it around the world. So we're in the business of saving the world economy by providing a system that supports the productivity and the happiness of the communities that we serve. And here are our vision. We're going to align the economic centers between payers and providers. We're going to be a simpler, more transparent consumer experience, and the technology is going to be seamless. We're already working with technology today, companies like Medtronic, that instead of waiting for weight gain to show up to determine we have congestive heart failure, we're gonna look at arterial, imp arterial impedance, that data that comes out of those pacemakers and get to the patient before they start gaining water weight. We did it with Bluetooth scale, where we put Bluetooth technology and we said to the patient, we're gonna make this really simple. Eat these pills in the morning and stand on that. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to do any math. You don't need to call anybody will come to you if there's a problem. And when a patient went out of tolerance, we went to their house, we made sure they were taking their meds. If they weren't, we re-educated them. If they were taking their meds, we called the doctor and updated them because they weren't working. And then we rolled up the rugs in the house as we left because patients shuffle when they walk, when they carry water weight, and they fall and they break the hip. We reduced our congestive heart failure readmissions by 49%. Each of those admissions cost us $100,000 a piece. It had a dramatic impact on our result. Now with Medtronic, we don't even have to wait for the weight gain. We don't have to screw around with the rugs. 
you can get them before they start shuffling around the house. This is the technology we have today. If any of you have that, then, you can have this on your phone. It has your ID card. It allows you to check symptoms, make an appointment with your doctor, find the lowest cost alternative based on what we believe your issue is, and then in the future, we'll allow you to pay your claim at the doctor's desk by auto adjudicating your claim immediately. We can do that today, nobody wants to use it, but we believe there will come a time when you'll be able to do all of it on your phone. So with that, I will take any questions the group has. I was born and raised in Detroit, so I cannot be intimidated or insulted. In the back, hand raised in the back, in the middle. Thank you, Mark. Um, I appreciate your vision. My question is, is this, do you think this is an Aetna vision or an industry vision? I think we're probably a little ahead of the industry on this issue. I mean, some of our competitors are actually buying provider systems um, and trying to integrate those provider systems. We don't think there's enough capital in the business to do that. Um, it's usually a very expensive proposition. However, we do have some of our competitors using our technology to connect their system together. So we think it's about the technology platform and making that valuable that will allow the system to function better. For every 50 basis points that we then trend on our current business, we save $480 million for our customers. So that's real money. And so we get more people doing it, I think that has an impact on that $810 million we're wasting every year. Other questions? Yes, sir. Can you talk about the difference between the private and public exchanges? Sure. So the public exchanges are very highly regulated, um, as we're finding out um, in the popular press today. Um, there are four plans. There's, there's bronze, bron well there's actually five, catastrophic, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, and you have to choose among those plans. And those plans are regulated by price by the insurance department uh, in the community and you get an online shopping experience which we'll see how it works when it gets up and working. That's sort of the public exchange marketplace. The private exchange marketplace is gonna be very different in that it's gonna be aimed at specific groups of people. So for example, we'll launch one of our first private exchanges in the hotel and restaurant industry. Um, in large part because in that industry, the healthcare system's not available when they're not at work. So they have high year usage, very low continuity of care. And so our product, we'll have an Amazon-like buying experience on front. We've already up and got it testing, it's working. Um, and we'll be using it with a number of clients in 2014. And this online buying experience allows us to provide thousands of plan design opportunities to everybody. Now that's confusing, who wants to go through all of that? But we allow you to put in data, last year's healthcare experiences, the kind of medications you're on, what doctors you use, to guide you to four or five plans that allow you to choose based on an economic basis up and down those four or five plans. But more importantly, based on those plans, we connect you to a network and a set of case managers to help manage your care more effectively. And so that whole model, we think, is gonna be sustainable longer term. We think that's gonna be a better model than the public exchanges, which try to put you into one of five products. And we think it'll be a better buying experience and a cheaper alternative. Yes, sir. Can you speak to the the, um, the future of long-term care versus acute care? So you're talking about insurance and presently, long-term care is going to be the, the cost that, in, that we're going to hit when we hit 65 and go on a fixed income. And right. So I think that's where the goal, that, where the opportunity is in the long run. Um, our goal is to impact that population by keeping people home versus keeping them institutionalized. And so the long-term care market is the new, new thing. I think it's a logistical issue. How do we get the right person to the house? We found this when we did our Bluetooth scale with congestive heart failure patients in a small market. How do we get the right people to the house at the right time to help the patient? But we think that's the better model longer term. We think that's where the opportunity is to reduce that $810 billion worth of waste in the system. Uh, and, and so we're very focused on that. Um, I've actually been to Washington to talk to them about what we could do to address the top 5% of Medicare who cost $108,000 a year in healthcare costs. 
and drive 245 billion of the 550 billion we spend on Medicare. So you have 5% of the population driving just under 50% of the healthcare spend in Medicare. How do we get at that population? How do we make sure that we provide them with the best coordinated model? You could almost send them to the best institutions across the country to get better. And you could drive them there um, in luxury uh, and, and have them uh, with, a, with a lower cost alternative because they're just wandering, literally wandering in the wilderness most of the time. So we're focused on this top 5%. I made a number of proposals as part of um, what we're calling entitlement reform in Washington. But how do we create a, a stronger safety net longer term by making sure that the people who are in that top 5% get cared for better so that we have more capacity to take care of others and prevent them from getting into the system? We really have two issues here. We have sick people that are driving most of the healthcare costs today. How do we get them better to the right place with the right providers? And that's working with the provider systems to do that. And then we have this 25 to 30 year journey on wellness that's gonna take a long time. There's nothing we can do to short circuit it. And people always say, well, that's going to take too long. Well, if we never start, it'll never happen. And so this whole idea of focusing on wellness while we're taking care of that top 5% in more effective ways, I think is, the, is going to make the difference longer term. Yes, sir. There's an incredible amount of roll-up in the, uh, the hospitals, uh, you know, uh, regionals and nationals buying, you know, locals and, uh, you know, nationals buying regionals. I'm assuming that's going to continue. What's the vision on that? Or can you help us understand? Is it going to end up is there going to be four or five players at the end of the day? Or? So you have to go back to the mid 70s and the mid 80s. It was called the Cold War. Um, and we had this thing called mutually assured destruction where we had tens of thousands of missiles aimed at each other. And that's what's happening in the healthcare marketplace between insurance companies and providers over the last decade. Right? They're getting bigger, we're getting bigger. And you know, we can have the game of stare down and who's gonna cancel whose contract. But what ends up happening in the, in, in the end of that is that the people in the middle, the member, actually get hurt by it. And so our shift to working with these new relationships with providers is recognizing that trend and saying, you know what, we've gotta work together differently. How can we become partners? Our most notable partnership is Inova, which can, uh, runs most of Northern Virginia, the Inova Health Systems. Knox Singleton is uh, you know, the CEO I've known for a long time. We have done a joint venture with Inova creating their own health plan. We've given them all the technology and they are one of our key products in the Virginia public exchange marketplace. We think that's the model of the future. You know, instead of fighting mutually assured destruction, let's stand down more than detente. Let's create cooperative relationships between us that help us move the health system forward in the name of controlling cost longer term. Yes. Or, uh, great talk uh, this morning. I figured somebody should bring up Obamacare since it's. Uh, yeah, I was waiting for that. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so, um, Health and Human Services is under the gun. Yep. Any view is this? Is there a short-term fix on this, or is this really a long-term uh, overhaul? So, you know, I've been well quoted on this. Um, I've been the White House pinata as a result. Um, <laughs> well, let me put it this way: When you get into this kind of situation with technology. You just don't have a whole lot of short-term fixes. I mean, you guys know that better than I do at Deloitte, and I've been here a couple times in my career. You have to free, you have first of all have a scope document that will be helpful to understand what the scope is you're trying to create, and then you need to freeze that scope. Then you need to assess what you have against it, turn off the stuff that doesn't work, keep the stuff that's running working, and then put patches in between until you can get the technology right. That's the plan. Now I you know. I've been, you know, Jeff Sainz and I are friends, and I've been on the phone with Jeff and have talked to him about that very plan and have offered our support. We are one of two alpha testers in the country, and we're working with the administration to try and get this fixed. Uh, but it is not going to be a short-term fix. It is going to be bumpy, and there's going to be a lot of noise around it. I think the opportunity is, is to be realistic about how long it's going to take. I think pushing the pause button to some degree would be a good thing. And I think if you do it right now, five to 10 years from now, nobody's gonna ever remember this. That's the opportunity. But trying to, you know, I think the one thing that, that Washington misses on this one is that they're in the mass media business. They are on the internet. You don't hide from that and you don't offer excuses for it. 
because it happens every day. As soon as somebody turns on the computer, they get an instant response on your capabilities and your value to them. I think that has to be something that we have to seriously consider in stopping that from being a continual story and to try to create continued pain. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, Tim. Mark, in the Affordable Care Act, um, it seemed that when that was being created, there were a couple of objectives, uh, increasing access and at least purportedly helping to control costs. Right. From your perspective, was there anything in there that gets at that second issue? The only, the only thing in the Affordable Care Act, there are two things in the Affordable Care Act that have an impact on costs. Um, one is what is called the Centers for Innovation at CMS, where we'll try some innovative pilots. And so there are some innovative pilots that we're part of, the Pioneer Grant with Banner. We were the engine behind Banner's a Pioneer Grant to take care of Medicare fee-for-service people in a fundamentally different way, like I had mentioned earlier, the, the, the sick is the sick. Can we do a better job of it? And that worked really well with us and Banner. We had a very good result from that. We were one of the top uh, three plans on that. The other really is, is the hope that the public exchanges would create a, 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 a competitive bid for membership um, as a result of having the exchanges up and running. Um, that didn't happen. Um, I think people have been generally cautious about the potential risk. I think we're starting to see now that, you know, in spite of data the other, to the contrary, that a lot of people under 35 are signing up. The people under 35 that are signing up largely are going into Medicaid. And the population that's signing up in the exchanges is largely in the higher age categories. And, and people who really need health care. Now, we've accommodated for that in our pricing and our expectations. We're not expecting to make money off of this population um, in the first year. Um, we're expecting to hold our own and to see how it goes. But I think you know the, the bottom line is, is that it's not um, it's not created the kind of competition people want it. At least on a price basis. Other questions? <coughs> we good on the time? Good. Guess up. One more in the back. Yeah. Well, um, I hear a lot on the talk radio about you know, the Affordable Care Act, but very large deductible for people not making very much money. Yeah, I think the in the attempt to provide a lower premium, the deductibles were raised. And generally for healthier people who don't think they're going to use the health care system, those deductibles are less of an economic issue for them. But I think for people that have illness, the subsidy based on their income is going to drive whether or not they have to pay anything net out of pocket. So the thinking was, and part of the 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 problem with the public exchange website rollout is they wanted people to understand their subsidy before they went into shop so they know how much subsidy they'd be getting from the government in order to pay for their premiums. That has not worked yet, so people are seeing these prices without understanding what their subsidies are yet. But the intent is for people who can't afford it, they get a subsidy to help offset the cost of some of that premium. But it's impossible for people to shop until they can see all that. Dan? You talked a lot about technology uh, in the management side. This enormous uh, exposure of technology in healthcare uh, itself, uh, isn't it at the point where you have to be engaged because, because they're inventing better and more healthcare than we can afford? We're obviously going to be a 20% GDP by 2020. Uh, there's just more healthcare than the nation can afford. And this job is going to be well, I think the way to, the, the, to address it is to change the economic model, whereby the healthier we keep people and the more appropriately we use technology, the more opportunity there is for, for margin. So um, one of my first boards of director on my first company was, was on none was on it. Her name was Sister Joyce DeShano. She recently passed away. And I went to see Sister Joyce um, about being on a for-profit board because I was concerned about her um, role on the board. And, and so I said to her, you know, Sister, I want to talk. And she stopped me like 
10 seconds into the park, you don't need to do this. I said, why, sister? And she said, well, you know, at the Daughters of Charity, we have a saying. I said, well, what is that, sister? And she goes, no margin, no mission. I get it. <laughs> now, Sister Joyce was one of the architects behind the creation of Ascension Health Care System, which is the largest healthcare system, and she was the most recent chairman as a nun of that institution before she passed away. And, and, and I was actually telling the story in another setting at one of the hymn settings, and, and, a, and a lady in the back got up and said, oh yeah, I know that, and she pulled off her sweater and she had a t-shirt on that said no margin omission on the back of it, and she worked at the Ascension Health System. So everybody has to generate a margin, and that margin generation creates opportunities to build a better system. And so the messy part of where we're at right now is over the next five to seven years, if we can get the economic model right, that you get paid by keeping people healthy and using your resources properly, over that capital cycle change, we can get hospitals to think differently about what they invest in. So they won't always have to have, as they say in Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, the machine that goes bang, right? They just need the right machines and the right technology, and they use it when it's appropriate versus using it because they get paid each time you do a service. And so I think this whole fee-for-service model, the notion that if I do something, I get paid for it, it's very Pavlovian. What we need to do is to say, when you develop a healthy patient, you get rewarded, and that help you, helps you maintain your margin, which helps you reinvest in your business and continue your mission. That's the way the system should be structured. That's what we want to provide. And what we'll be able to provide is all of those things around efficacy. We'll be able to provide the big data. I've met with a gentleman named Vinod Kosla who helps Sun start Sun Microsystems. He has two pieces of technology I was absolutely wild at, and this is the kind of technology changes that are happening for $5. He has a case that goes back on the back of an iPhone. It has two pads on the back. You put your thumb on the pads, and it gives you a single AKG that you can send to your doctor immediately. On your iPhone. He has a pair of glasses that you put on that reads your prescription and allows you to send it to your optical shop to create glasses. He's using it in China. He can't get it approved here in the United States for legitimate economic reasons. Um, there's an industry that gets impacted by that, but he had $5 it cost him to make these glasses. So the technology, the data bits, all of the information that people are gonna have about how the healthcare system is gonna work is gonna be much, so our role is gonna be big data and saying this works or doesn't work. You need to handle the data you want. Your economic incentive is to do the right thing and get people healthy. That's the change in the model, versus us being the bad cop, because we can't be everywhere, and we don't want to be in the middle between every patient position relationship. Yes? I like your, I triage is your app, right? I triage is our app, I and like, it's free, by the way. I, I like the app, so PSA on that, it's, it's a great app. Uh, do you see that uh, eventually tying into some of the, uh, you know, the wristbands and some of the other technologies that can talk to the app? So it does today it through, does a, uh, through an app called CarePass. So we created an app called CarePass that ties I triage to Fitbit, to you know your run, your bicycling, um, app, whatever app you have on there. So I have Fitbit and I have my um, bicycle road bike app on there. And, and so Runtastic bike app. And you can connect all of that. And so when your heart rate's recorded, it updates your Fitbit, it updates your road app, it updates your um, uh, eye triage information and your personal health record. So we've created this app called CarePass that connects all of the technology together. Next year, what it will be able to do is you'll be able to buy on the spot market capacity in the healthcare system. So you're on your way home from work. By the way, everybody get their flu shots. Um, you're on your way home from work, you haven't got your flu shot. You'll be able to find a flu shot near you on the way home. Book it, stop and get it. At CVS, at Walmart, at a doctor's office. The last place you want to go is a hospital where you have to park and walk to the parking garage and into the institution, all the sick people. So you want to be able to go do it in an easy fashion. So it's about creating, redefining quality as convenience for the individual and having the healthcare system work for them. So all of that is launched. We did a study this year with Nordstrom's um, and using that technology for their employees. And the ability to get office visits, flu shots, lab tests, and x-rays on the spot market available for me now is the new thing. And it's going to change the way people use the healthcare system. But download CarePass, it's also free. Um, and, and you can connect it with your eye triage and your other apps you have on your phone right now. Whatever you get the flu shot. You good? Any other questions?
Going, going. One Ken? last one. Where, um, where in the scheme of things is the need for tort reform to get our arms around it? So back on that chart, tort reforms about one and a half percent. That's it. Yep. Uh, now some people could argue it may be three percent or three and a half percent. So all the issues that worry me at night about the things we need to deal with to get rid of that eight hundred ten billion dollars, that's probably lower on the totem pole and probably the, one of the hardest ones to do. The political and economic barriers to some of these issues in the United States are pretty difficult to address, um, and so I would say that you know that's one that's not driving um, the, the main line underlying costs. It's really the health of the population and the waste in the system because it's a non-system. And we really need to get at both of those. Great. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you. Hey Mark, thank you very much. I can't begin to tell you how grateful we are that you took some time out of what must be a terribly crazy schedule at this point. Um, to help make some of these students' dreams a reality, so thank you. Um, as a small way, on behalf of the foundation, to thank you for your generosity and uh, the willingness of Edna to play a role in this, um, we decided to create a Mark Bertolini Edna Scholarship, and so for the next two years, there will be a $1,500 award given to a deserving student in your name. So thank you very much. And who knows, those Recipients may become an employee someday. So. <laughs> okay, so that wraps up for today. I do have a few other just closing comments and thank yous. Um, I again want to thank all of you for the support you gave to this event today. Um, in particular, again, I ask for a big round of applause, applause for our executive sponsor, Deloitte Consulting. Um, we do have some materials on the tables about the foundation. Um, please take them with you. Um, and if you would, if after hearing what we're all about, decide you'd like to get involved in any way as a volunteer, potentially as a member of the board, um, or as a donor, because just like the exchanges, we've got a platinum, gold, bronze, and silver <laughs> levels as well we can contribute. Um, so we graciously welcome any support that you can give us. Um, also, um, as anybody knows who's trying to put one of these things together, there are a tremendous number of logistics involved. And uh, there are two, uh, there are a bunch of people who help make this happen, but there are two people in particular I want to thank for their efforts because um, the, their last couple of weeks must have just been hellish. Um, one, our executive de director, Ms. Jen Stephanie, who's back there. <laughs> One last thing, I would like to, it also in making this all happen, there were a bunch of the foundation board members that um, worked miracles. And so to the extent that there are any foundation board members here, would you please stand up? I'd like to thank you guys. Okay, that concludes our program for today. Thank you again, and we hope to see you back here next year. Thanks.